Hello and welcome to Mathematics 4. This semester we're going to be talking about a type of mathematics called differential equations. Today I'm going to start by giving some information about this course and then we will cover the first four topics. An introduction, some examples, we'll talk about how to draw a direction field and then we'll, we'll look at solving our first differential equations. I'm expecting to give you approximately 13 classes for this course and they will all be on a Thursday afternoon between 1 o'clock and 3 o'clock. The way I teach is for the first approximately 60 minutes I'm going to give you a lecture and then I will be available to answer your questions in the second hour. Whether or not we use the full second hour is up to you. If there are not 60 minutes worth of questions, then it will be okay for us to finish early. I'm saying I will take approximately 60 minutes, but this will vary from week to week. Some weeks I will be more than 60 minutes, some weeks I might be a little bit less than 60 minutes, but I'm going to try to divide the topic so that we are, to, that I'm talking for roughly 60 minutes each week. We can think of the topics in this course as divided into five. We'll start with the introduction. We'll, then we will study first order differential equations second and higher order differential equations. We will look to see how we can use the Laplace transform to solve differential equations. And then finally, we will study systems of first order linear equations. And I'm expecting to, to break the course up like this. The first four weeks, we'll be talking about the introduction and the first order equations. And then we'll spend three weeks on each of the final three topics. I have lecture notes for this course, which you can find in the content um, material section of OLEARN. If you will notice that the lecture notes and the lectures are very, very similar. So if you want to follow up, if you want to print this out or view the lecture notes on another screen, you can follow along with the lectures. Um, assessing this course, the information on this slide will change depending on the decisions of the university. At the moment, I'm assuming that we will split the marks like this. There will be homework, which I'm expecting to be worth about 20% of this course. There'll be one midterm exam, also worth 20%, and then the final exam will be worth 60%. For the homework, I'm going to give you multiple choice tests on the OLEARN system. There will be a new test every week or almost every week, and I'll give more information later. The midterm exam, I'm expecting to be an online exam on OLEARN. And for the final exam, we don't know yet. It depends on what the university decides. Maybe this will be an online exam, or if the, if the situation in the world changes, the university might like to have classroom exams. <coughs> if I was teaching this, this course to you in a classroom, then we would have four hours of lectures each week. And the expectation is that you would study another one to two hours outside of class each hour of le lecture. So you would be expected to study between eight and 12 hours um, each week. No, we're not going to be using the Pearson lab. We're going to use the OLEARN system for homework. Because this is not a classroom course, this is an online course, we will have only two hours of class each week, but still you would be expected to study somewhere between eight and 12 hours each week in total. 
So you're going to be expected to do more reading and more outside study than you would otherwise in a classroom course. You will be doing the homework tests each week. You can rewatch the lectures. They will be available on both OLAN and on YouTube. You should be spending time reading the lecture notes or the slides. Perhaps you want to read before the lecture to, to know what's coming, or perhaps you want to read later. The lecture notes have lots of problems in, which you should be using to test yourself. You can use the discussion board to discuss with other students or to ask questions to me. You can read books about differential equations, or you could watch videos on the internet from other teachers. Let me recommend two good books about differential equations. These are not required purchases. You can buy these if you want, you can, or if you don't want to, don't buy them. My advice would be wait two or three weeks and then see if you think you need a book. Boyce's Elemental Differential Equations and Boundary Value Problems is perhaps closer to the course. The order I'm teaching this course is based more on this book. So if you want a book which is close to the course, this was the one to get. The second book, Elementary Differential Equations with Boundary Value Problems by Edwards and Penny, teaches differential equations in a different order, which can be useful if you don't understand the way I'm teaching and you want to study differential equations in a different way. You will note that in the bottom corner I have the slide number. This will give you an idea as to how far through a lecture I am. Or if you want to ask questions at the end of the lecture, make a note of the slide number that you're asking about so we can go back and look together. And you will see that I'm putting the section title at the top. So if you're following along in the lecture notes, you'll be able to find where we are. Now let's begin the material. First, let's give an introduction to differential equations. If I said solve x plus 3 is equal to 5, if I asked you to solve this equation, then what I'm looking for is I want you to find some number x which satisfies this. But if instead I said solve dy dx is equal to 2x, then this time I don't want a number. This time I'm looking for a function, y of x, which satisfies this. What is a differential equation? A differential equation is just an equation which contains a derivative. So for example, dy dx is equal to 2x. This is an equation. This equation contains a derivative. Therefore, this is a differential equation. So let's do this. Solve dy dx is equal to 2x. This is actually easy to solve. We know that y of x is the integral of the derivative of y by the fundamental theorem of calculus. So all we're doing is we're integrating 2x to find x squared plus c. The solution to this differential equation is y is equal to x squared plus c. Next example. This problem has two conditions. First, we have the differential equation that we just looked at, but now we have an extra condition. Now I'm requiring that y at 0 is equal to 5. The first line is a differential equation. The second line is called an initial condition. Altogether, the problem is called an 
initial value product, or in short notation, which we're going to be using a lot, this is an IVP. We've already solved the differential equation in the previous example. We already know that y is equal to x squared plus c for some constant satisfies the first part of this problem. To solve the whole problem, we need to find the value of c such that y of 0 is equal to 5. So what we do is we start with this. We start with what we want. We just write it in the opposite order. 5 is equal to y of 0, which is 0 squared plus c, or c. And then straight away we can see we must have c is equal to 5. Therefore, the solution to the initial value problem is y is equal to x squared plus 5. <coughs> Another initial value problem. Solve dy dx is equal to sine x with the initial condition y of 0 is equal to 3. We do this in the same way. First, we're going to solve the differential equation, and then we're going to find the value of c, which satisfies the initial condition. So as before, we calculate that y of x must be minus cos x plus some constant c. And then we use the initial condition, 3 is equal to y of 0. And we find that the constant must be 4. And then we have our solution. The solution to the initial value problem is minus cos x plus 4. Solve dy dx is equal to y. Now, this is different. Previous ones, we always had a function of x on the right, but now we have y. This is actually slightly more difficult to solve. I'm going to show, show you how to solve this equation later. Let's look at some examples where differential equations occur in engineering or physics. Many problems in engineering, science, and the social sciences can be modeled using differential equations. I'm going to start by giving three simple examples. First example is the example of a falling object. Suppose we have an object of mass 10 kilograms, and suppose that the object is falling straight downwards. We're expecting that gravity is acting on the object, that gravity is pulling the object downwards, and we're expecting drag to be acting on the object. Gravity will try to make the object go faster and faster. Drag will try to make the object slow down. I suppose that v of t is the velocity pointing downwards. I'm going to measure velocity in meters per second. And let's suppose that t is time measured in seconds. Newton's second law says force is equal to mass times acceleration. Mass is 10 kilograms. Acceleration is the derivative of velocity. So it says acceleration is dv dt. Before I go on, v is measured in meters per second. t is measured in seconds. So dv over dt is measured in meters per second over seconds, or meters per second squared. Now let's go back to this picture. The force is acting on the object. Gravity is pointing in the same direction as velocity, so gravity should be a positive force. Drag is pointing in the opposite direction from velocity, so drag we should consider as a negative force. On the Earth, the gravity of an object of mass 10 kilograms is approximately 10 g, where g is approximately 9.8 meters per second squared. 
<coughs> it's reasonable to assume, as long as the object isn't traveling too quickly, that drag is proportional to velocity. Proportional means drag is equal to some constant multiplied by velocity. Where our constant gamma is a positive constant which depends on the shape of the object. We have a streamlined object, we'd expect gamma to be a small number. If we had an, op an object which is not streamlined, such as a, a parachute, we would expect gamma to be a big number. For our example, let's just put a number in. Let's suppose that gamma is two kilograms per second. Then force is mass times acceleration and force is gravity minus drag. We find that 10 dV dt is equal to 98 minus 2V. Divide by 10, we get the acceleration dV dt is equal to 9.8 minus V over 5. This is our differential equation for the falling object. We're going to solve this equation later. But first, to try to understand this equation without solving it, I want to look at the, this differential equation's direction field. <coughs> the direction field is <coughs> sorry. A direction field is just a grid of arrows in, in this case, the TV plane, which shows the slope of the solutions slope of solutions to the differential equation. And the direction field for our differential equation looks like this. I'm going to show you how to draw a direction field later today. What this means is, if the velocity is 40, 41, 42, something like that, the acceleration will go faster and faster, and the velocity will increase. If the velocity is up here, if the velocity is, say, 60, then we expect that the velocity to decrease. Let's suppose we start at, say, 54 then the arrows tell us what a solution looks like. I'm going to start just here. The arrow says the solution goes downwards. So we can draw a little bit of solution. And then we get to the next arrow. The arrow says it goes down, but it's a bit slower, and so on. When we get down to 50, again, the arrow says we're going down, but now we're going down very, very slowly. So just from following the ways that the arrows are pointing, I expect the solution, the graph of the solution, to look something like this. And in fact, if I use a computer to plot the true solution, it looks like this. We can then guess at some more solutions. We can guess that if we start at the velocity 60, the solution to the differential equation will look like this. Again, the curve just follows the way that the arrows are pointed. We can guess that if we start at 42, the solution looks like this, and so on. We can also guess that somewhere in the middle, in this case at 49, there will be a solution where the velocity doesn't change. Note that if the velocity is 49, if we put 49 into the differential equation, we get dv dt is equal to 9.8 minus, in this case, 49 over 2, which is equal to 0. Therefore, vt equal to 49 is a constant solution or an equilibrium solution of our differential equation.
Next example, let's take an example from biology. Let's suppose we're talking about mice and owls. Let P of T denote the population of mice in some area, where now we're going to measure time T in months. We're going to assume that there's plenty of food for the mice to eat. So as long as nothing eats the mice, the population of mice will just increase and increase, and it will increase at a rate which is proportional to P. So we can write dP dt is proportional to P. Proportional means is equal to constant multiplied by it. So we're expecting dP dt to be equal to some constant R multiplied by P. And just to make this a little bit easier, let's put some numbers in. Let's just suppose that R is 0 0.5 per month. So we have, so far we have the differential equation, dP dt is equal to P over 2. However, let's suppose that the mice are not alone in, the, in this area. Let's suppose there's also five owls in this area. And let's suppose that each owl eats three mice each day. But that means that the five owls meet eat, let's say, 450 mice each month. We need to change our differential equation to account for this. We had dp dt is equal to p over 2 before. That's how much it changes each month. Because the mice are being eaten each month, we're going to have minus 450 on the end of the differential equation. We're going to be studying the dp dt is equal to p over 2 minus 450. Let's look at a direction field for this equation. Using a computer, I've plotted this direction field. As before, we can follow the arrows to make some guesses at solutions to this differential equation. And we can guess that some solutions look like this. Third example, third and final example in this section. Let's talk about a cup of coffee. Newton's law of cooling states that the temperature of an object changes at a rate which is proportional to the difference between its temperature and that of its surroundings. The idea is if we have a hot cup of coffee, it will cool down quickly. If we have a cup of coffee which is only slightly warmer than the room that we're in, the temperature of the coffee will cool down. The coffee will cool down more slowly. Let's suppose that the temperature of your cup of coffee obeys Newton's law of cooling. Let's suppose it has a temperature of 90 degrees when it's freshly poured. And let's suppose that your room is 20 degrees centigrade. We are asked to, to write a differential equation for the temperature of your coffee. We're going to expect the coffee to cool like this. We're expecting that we, st we start at 90 degrees. We're told that we start at 90 degrees. We expect that to start with, the coffee cools down quickly. But as we get closer to the temperature of the room, as we get closer to 20 degrees, the coffee will cool down more slowly. First, we need variables and we need units. Let's suppose capital K of T is the temperature of the coffee in degrees centigrade. Let's suppose T denotes time, and let's suppose we're using minutes. Then by Newton's law of cooling, we're told that the rate of change of the temperature of the coffee is proportional to the difference between the temperature of the room, that's 20 degrees, and the temperature of the coffee. 
k. Proportional means is equal to some constant multiplied by 20 minus k. And if we think about it, hot coffee should cool down. Very cold coffee, let's suppose we start with iced coffee, we would expect that to warm up. So if we think about this, R should be a positive number. Section 1.3 is about how to draw a direction field. I've shown you two direction fields already today, but how do, how do we draw this by hand? First, think about graphs of the function y is equal to mx, just for different values of m. I've drawn a few here. For example, y is equal to 2x is this one. You see it slopes upwards, and the derivative or slope of this line is 2. m is a half. We have a line with slope a half, and so on. We indicate the slope of the direction field at different points with arrows which have the same slope as these lines. If we have part, if we know that the solution to a differential equation has slope two, we're going to draw an arrow like this over it. If we find out that a solution to a differential equation has slope a half, we're going to draw an arrow like the green one. Note that all of these arrows are pointing to the right. In this type of direction field, none of the arrows should point to the left, they should all point to the right. For example, draw a direction field for dy dx is equal to x plus y. We'll start with a grid, a grid of points between, let's say, minus 2.5 and 2.5 on the x-axis and on the y-axis. I want to draw an arrow on each one of these points. So I'm going to be, I'm going to need to draw 11 multiplied by 11 or 121 arrows. We start by calculating dy dx at a few points and filling in a few arrows. For example, let's start with 0, 0. We have x is 0 and y is 0. We put these values into the differential equation. We have 0 plus 0 or 0. To show that the slope is 0 here, we draw a horizontal arrow. We can look at the point 1, 0, the point where x is 1 and y is equal to 0. We put these numbers into the differential equation. x plus y is 1 plus 0, or 1. We find that at this point, dy dx is equal to 1. We show this by drawing an arrow of slope 1 at the point 1, 0, and so on. At the point 2, 0, the slope is 2. We have an arrow which points upward to the slope 2. At the point minus 1, 0, dy dx is equal to minus 1. So we have an arrow which points downwards with slope minus 1, and so on. At the point 0, 1, at the point minus um, 0, minus 1, at the point 1, 1, the slope is equal to 2, and so on. Here are 10 points where I've calculated the arrow. Let me tidy this up a little bit.
I want to draw 121 arrows, and so far I've drawn 10. So we still have 111 to draw. It's not necessary to calculate dy dx at each point. Instead, after we've done the first few, we can make some guesses. We're going to look for patterns, and we're going to guess. First of all, let's look at this diagonal line. You will notice that there are three arrows along here, and they all have slope zero. It's reasonable to guess that all of the arrows along here also have slope zero. So we can guess, we can just make a guess, and we can just quickly fill in all of these arrows. We could look at a horizontal line, such as these. What's happening as we move along from the left to the right? As we move from the left to the right, the arrows are rotating anti-clockwise. We can make a guess that this behavior happens all along the line. So we can guess that we could fill in the arrows like this. What happens on a vertical line as we go from the bottom to the top? Again, it appears that the arrows are rotating anti-clockwise as we go from the bottom to the top. So we make a guess and we fill the rest of the arrows in like this. And so on. Keep going, keep making guesses. We can quickly fill in all 121 arrows. Another example, draw a direction field for dy dx is equal to xy. If you're re-watching the video of this lecture, I encourage you to pause the video here and try to do it yourself. I'm going to show you the answer. Draw a direction field for dy dx is equal to y multiplied by x plus y. Again, if you are re-watching the video of this, consider pausing the video here, trying to draw it yourself, and then pressing play again. The answer looks like this. Our final topic for today is the topic solving our first differential equations. Two of the equations that we looked at before were equation one and equation two. Equation one was the equation for the falling object. Equation two was the equation for the mice and the hours. You will note that these two equations are of the same form. They're both of the form dy dt is equal to ay minus b for some constants a and b. In this section, we're going to study how to solve differential equations like this. First, let's look at the mice and the owls. dp dt is equal to p over 2 minus 450, or to make it slightly easier to solve, I'm writing this as p minus 900 divided by 2. If P is not 900, we can imagine that we can rearrange this equation. We can take the dt on the left. We can imagine multiplying both sides of the differential equation by dt to move this dt to the right-hand side. And we can imagine dividing both sides of the differential equation by P minus 900 to bring the p minus 900 over here. We can imagine that we can rearrange this differential equation to dp divided by p minus 900 is equal to half dt. The reason we do this is we want to move all of the p variables to one side of the equal sign and all of the t variables to the other side of the equal sign.
we have two P terms. There's a P here and a P here. They're both on the left. We have one T term, which is on the right. We've separated the P's from the T's. Now, before we go on, let me just remark that dp dt does not really mean dp divided by tt. And the method I'm showing you now is a method which annoys pure mathematicians, but it works. This method works. The key idea to remember is if we can separate the variables like this, if we can move all of the p terms to the left and all of the t terms to the right, then we're allowed to integrate the, the equation. What I mean is we're allowed to put an integral sign on both sides. And if I can repeat myself, this is only true if we can separate the variables. Some equations we can do this, some equations we can't separate the variables. We still end up with the two variables mixed together on one side of the equal sign. If that's the case, then this method doesn't work. If we can separate them, in this case, all of the P terms to the left, all of the T terms to the right, then the method works and we're allowed to integrate the equation. The integral of 1 over p minus 900 is the natural logarithm of the absolute value of p minus 900. And the integral of a half is just t over 2. And of course, we need a constant of integration. We only need one constant of integration. So we know that the natural logarithm of the absolute value of p minus 900 is equal to t over 2 plus some constant k. We can rearrange this to solve for p. First, we take the exponential of both sides to get rid of the natural logarithm. And on the right-hand side, we then have e to the power t over 2 plus k. Next, I want to get rid of the absolute value signs. And we can do this by adding a plus or minus here. I have p minus 900 is plus or minus e to the power of k, e to the power of t over 2. Take the 900 to the right. p must be 900 plus or minus e to the power of k, e to the power of t over 2. What is k? k is a constant. k is a number that we don't know. But then e to the power of k is also a number that we don't know. So plus or minus e to the power of k is a number that we don't know, it's some constant. We can give this constant a new name. Instead of writing plus or minus e to the power k each time, we can give us an, a different letter, different name. We can say that this unknown number is c. Then we have that p is equal to 900 plus some unknown constant c, e to the power t over 2. We can solve the falling object problem in the same way. Solve d v dt is equal to 9.8 minus v over 5. Here's the whole calculation. The first thing I want to do is I want to rearrange this. I want to move all of the V terms to the left and all of the T terms to the right. So first I change the right hand side to 49 minus V over 5 because of course 49 divided by 5 is equal to 9.8. 
Then I move V minus 49 to the left and DT to the right. Why am I keeping the minus sign on the right? Just so that the left side is easier to integrate. I don't want to be worrying about minus signs on the left while I'm doing my integration. So I'm saving, I'm keeping the minus sign on the right. Now I've separated the variables. I have V terms on the left and I have all of the T terms on the right. If we can do this, if we can separate the variables, then we are allowed to integrate the equation. I have that the integral of dv over v minus 49 is equal to the integral of minus 1 over 5. The integral of 1 over v minus 49 is the natural logarithm of the absolute value of v minus 49. And the integral of minus 1 over 5 is minus t over 5. And we need a constant, so plus k on the end. Then, just as we did before, we can rearrange this to find that v is equal to 49 plus or minus e to the power k, e to the power minus t over 5. Plus or minus e to the power k is a bit chunky, a bit messy. We can give this unknown number a new name. We can call this C. And then we get the solution 49 plus constant C e to the power minus T over 5. And that is the end of this week's lesson. Next week, we're going to be studying classification. That will be the end of chapter one. And we'll start talking about first order differential equations. We will talk about linear equations and separable equations. This week, I spent less than 60 minutes because it was the first week. Later weeks, I will be closer to 60 minutes for my lesson. If you have any questions, you can ask them in the chat now. This is slide 29. Mm. Yes, that should be a five, not a two. I will fix that and then I will upload the corrected slides for you to look at later.
Okay, if, if you don't have any questions, you are welcome to leave whenever you wish. I'm going to take a 10 minute break and then I'll come back to check if there are any questions. So if you have questions, wait around for 10 minutes and then ask me then.